Hi, I'm Simon Marcel. I'm the founder of Propel Your MSP. I will tell you how I was able to build our MSP from zero to over 100 staff in 18 years. Paul Green's MSP Marketing Podcast. Extended Interview. Hi, I'm Simon Marcel from S3 Technologies and also Propel Your MSP. And Simon, you sent me a wonderful email. It was back in November last year and it's taken us ages to actually get this conversation sorted out. But you sent me an email saying you'd built up your MSP over, I think it was 18 years to 100 staff doing virtually no marketing. Now that is the kind of success story that I thought has got to get onto this podcast. So tell us about your MSP. You're based in Canada, aren't you? Correct. We're based in Montreal and we started in 2003. So it's been a long time. Um, we sort of built the business uh, really one client at a time and also one staff member at a time. Right now, we currently have uh, about 100 staff. Um, what's particular um, for our MSP is we actually have larger clients. So um, we roughly have 65 clients. Um, so we're part of uh, peer groups in the US. And uh, we really stand out with that in the sense that our clients are, are much larger than the typical MSPs, which has some positives and also some negatives. Positives being that the larger clients really keep you on your toes and also um, kind of expose you to, um, I'd say, what's coming next in the smaller clients a lot quicker, like more quickly. Let's return back to the um, to the larger whale clients later on in the interview. I'd, I'd first of all like to just go back to 2003. Tell us what you were doing. So what what made you, how, how old were you then? Because you seem quite young now, Simon. Yeah, I was 23 at the okay. time. Wow. Most of us were still working in McDonald's or something at that point. So tell us, tell, us, tell us about 23-year-old you and what made you decide to start an IT services firm in the first place? So it actually started much earlier than that. It actually started in 1997 or 1998. Um, so I have two partners in our, in our company now. So myself and one of our partners started a small company after high school where we just did service for sort of family members and, and you know friends of families. Mostly it was people at home, but we also had some small businesses. As the summer kind of rolled around or, or came to an end, we had to um, start university and we, we were enrolled in computer engineering. And that's when we realized that, yeah, we might not have enough time to take care of all these clients. So we found somebody to kind of give our clients to who had a um, basically more of a, a hardware sales um, shop at the time. This is in 1990. Yeah, seven or eight. And I started working there um, part time uh, through university. Do you remember the, 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 the year 2000 bug? Yeah, so people the Y2K were buying bug, hardware, yeah. like Exactly, the Y2K bug. So people were buying hardware like crazy. Yeah. And, but the, the margins were going down. So all these guys, like most IT firms, were selling hardware and they'd buy servers and sell them at 100% markup. It was crazy. And that was their business. But that was coming to an end in those years as it was getting more and more competitive. And that's something I actually saw while working there, still in university. And so we used to sell these servers, these small businesses, and they'd almost like give the service away. It was kind of like if you bought your hardware from the shop, um, we'd install it for free. And I realized this was nuts. I'm like, well, the service actually has good margin on it. And, um, and that's what we should focus on. And I actually wrote a whole call it program or business offer around kind of what is an MSP today, meaning proactive service to these clients. And this is in like, yeah, 1998, 99, maybe by then. And I went out and I sold it to uh, a bunch of clients and we sort of started what was a mini MSP. When I finished university, I, I guess I was a bit naive. I thought, uh, I don't know what I thought. I thought I'd get a crazy offer, maybe become a partner or something nuts, but uh, I was just a young kid, maybe a little cocky and realized that basically that that wasn't going to happen. So uh, decided to pretty much start it on our own. Yeah, it's pretty impressive to to have. I mean, I've only been in this world six, seven years, but to to to, to, to for you to have that kind of foresight um, back then was was pretty impressive. So, how quickly did the did the company grow at first? I mean, did did you have big ambitions for it, or was it a case of uh, just as you said earlier, win a client, take on a member of staff, win a client, take someone on? We definitely had a lot of ambition, maybe a little too much actually at the time, but we were you know we were twenty three years old. Um, we, we started out of our apartments. Um, we didn't have any, any money really to start. So it was really, yeah, one client at a time. We were, um, and I, I thank my partner Vince for this. We were really, really good with our money, meaning saving up our money, not taking on debt. 
But it's funny, I think in those years, it almost gave us credibility, you know, and the fact that we only sort of did service and we did have like an sort of an all you can eat price at that time was completely different. And what at what point did you realize that we're building something special here? Because you, 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 I don't speak to many MSPs that are at the, at the size and the level at which you guys are at. W- was there a point at which you 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 got there and you thought, "Wow, we we could really take this somewhere"? Or did you did you get it to a certain point and you were considering an exit? Sort of talk us through the if you like the the, the middle the middle age of the of the business. So we realized that we were doing something that was different in the sense that we were really focused on recurring revenue. Any client that wasn't going to take sort of the full package with us wasn't the right client for us. But I think when it clicked in is, so we got invited to, at the time we were dealing with Ingram Micro and they had uh, their VTN group and they invited us to a conference in San Francisco and we met uh, Gary Pika, who'd actually mm. just sold his company. So I don't remember yeah. which year that was. And he was giving a talk about this new MSP model, you know? So we're sitting there and he's kind of talking about it. We're like, oh, he's describing our business. We've been doing this forever. At the end of his talk, he asked the room, we're like, you know, how many people here have recurring revenue? So he says, I think lift up your hand if you have $10,000 in recurring revenue. So of course, we've got our hand up. Then he says, okay, keep your hand up if you have like 20,000, 30,000, 40. So by... I don't know, I want to say 50,000. I think everybody's hands down. And we had over 200,000 uh, of MRR at that time. Wow. And he came to see us at the end. He was like, okay, basically, he was like, who the hell are you guys? Where are you? How come I've never heard of you? <laughs> it's kind of funny because we've been doing our thing in our in our little island, you know, uh, yeah. until then. So, How did you find these people? Because that's... You know, a lot of the MSPs I speak to would would love to have as much as they're, they're scared of whales, qu- as quite rightly you should be. You know, any anything that's over twenty percent of your revenue is is a is a threat, a massive threat to the continuity of the business on it on its own. Um, they, but they, but everyone would love a fifty hundred user uh, business. So you guys, you've already admitted you didn't do much marketing. Um, where where do you get these from? Was it from referrals? So we do AdWords. So we've done mm. a lot of AdWords. So people definitely find our website. Um, so some people will call us, they, they find us online. And then obviously we have, we have some partners we work with either, you know, we're different consultants or, or yeah. So referrals, my partner, Mark would, uh, he's in charge of sales. He would actually do, um, he's even done some cold calls at the time at some oh, wow. larger clients. Wow. Yeah. And worked on, on some of those. So I shouldn't say that, that we didn't do any sales or marketing, but we've done very much like minimal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have one salesperson, you know, we have a hundred people. It doesn't really make sense. Well, no, actually it, it does because uh, if, if you've got a very clear idea of the kind of client you want and it's, it's you know, a minimum hundred users or whatever your minimum is, what's the point of having three salespeople? Because there's only a finite number of new clients that you can onboard. In, in, you know, I'd imagine an onboarding for you is a, is a fairly impactful. It's huge, yes. Yeah, but it is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah I imagine yeah, yeah. It's, it's something to look forward to and dread at, at, um, at the same time. Um you, you said something earlier, you said, um, we turn down clients that we don't want. So to put it into my words, you're very picky about the kind of clients that you take. Now today, Absolutely. I can imagine that's not a difficult thing for you, especially if you personally are not involved in the selling. You haven't got to sit there and see the whites of their eyes and you know t- turn someone down or not even bother having the meeting with them. You've got, you've got someone else to do that for you. Go back to in your mind to when that was actually a big thing, you know, because most, most businesses for much of their life will take on pretty much anyone who's, who's got the money and is, is willing to, to buy the services. So how difficult was it for you to turn away the, the wrong kind of clients? Maybe it's because we were already, we were always very responsible for our money, not having any debt and um, kind of knowing what the kind of relationship we wanted with our clients too. We worked very hard uh, growing the business and, and, you know, you know, if we were going to um, basically put that much effort into our clients, we wanted somebody who would respect us and have a mm. good, you know, have a, a good relationship with. It's funny you say um, we, we, you, you're going to work crazy for someone. You might as well be respected by them. But how many MSPs do you know who have clients that don't respect them, and and yet the MSPs keep them on month after month after month? Let's make should we make this National Fire a Client Day? Yeah. I think it's it would be that would be a great thing to achieve. Or, or better still, don't take them on in the first place. I in would fact, say I that's the better a, option. <laughs> I was just doing a consult um, just before I, I, re- I recorded uh, this interview with you, Simon, with one of my MSP Marketing Edge members.
members. And he's he's only been going, um, I think it was about seven months. And uh, he, he has deliberately reduced his price so that he's 30% under market value. So let's say market value is, is roughly what everyone else is charging. Mm-hmm. And, and he's using that as his, as his selling point. And I had an aneurysm when he told me that because it's, it, apart from the, I mean, he's got 14 years experience. It's just the company happens to be seven years, seven months old. What I said to him was, well, A, those people you're selling cheap, you, it's going to take you years to get them up to market value. And by then market value will have gone up. But B, you know, these, you are, because you're, he's telling them, we are we are cheaper because we've just got started. It's kind of he's actually um, starting the relationship off in completely the wrong way, and he's making it more difficult for them to buy from him because they're then they're picking him on price, or the temptation is to pick him on price rather than the fact he's been doing this for fourteen years and his business partner's been doing it for twenty years or whatsoever. So I think it, it, it does. You're right. It comes from from getting it right um, early up. So you have a side venture. And that's called Propel Your MSP. So what what is this and and when did you get started with this? Yeah, so Propel, we started it three years ago. So something that we've done in our MSP from the beginning is we were always really, really strong on, um, call it the VCIO side of thing or the Mm. strategic planning with clients. Yeah. Every time we take on a client, we had a clear roadmap for them, usually a three-year roadmap with a very detailed budget of where they were going. Um, And this is something that gave us I think huge credibility of the client. This is probably why we got a lot of referrals as well at the time. And it just showed that we were obviously proactive, but also in control of the infrastructure. There's nothing worse than going to see a client and saying, hey, there's there's this thing, you know, whatever it is, that's unplanned and you need to spend money right now. So for us, that was always really, really important. And as the company grew, I'd built like these systems to make, because it's, it takes a long time to do. So I'd built these different systems to like automate it. As we hired VCIOs, it got really difficult to have them give out the same quality uh, of um, of strategic planning and of roadmaps. We we started the business. The business is all about uh, VCIOs. It's basically a tool for them to produce roadmaps for their clients and to ensure that basically, I mean, the most important thing is to be the trusted advisor to your clients. And once that starts slipping, or if you're not the trusted advisor, somebody else is their trusted advisor. So for us, it's really to, to maximize the VCIO time, to maximize the proactivity um, that you're doing for the client. And Propel really comes in. It's funny, when we built it, the idea of it was, how can we save time on our VCIOs? Like they're taking, it's taking too long to produce these things. And that was the first goal. But funny enough, as we started using the product more and more, I realized that really the biggest benefit was the consistency. Now we're, devel- we're delivering these plans to all clients and also, um, I mean, this is going to sound silly, but there's no mistakes. The data is accurate. Do you know, I, I'm, as, as, I'm, as I'm talking about this, I'm thinking you must be some kind of visionary because you were doing VCIO stuff, you know, <laughs> 10, 15 years before anyone even even coined the phrase, I'm sure. Um, yeah. you, you seem to have set yourself up with the managed services uh, model uh, long before uh, managed services was even a thing. So I am definitely asking you on our YouTube interview uh, what the next big trend is. And then I'm going to put money into that because you, you clearly seem to know what you're doing. I do want to just pick up on some of the some of the things that you've mentioned, and, and the first one is staff. So you have a hundred staff. Clearly, you have a, a management structure in place because that's what allows you to sit in a hotel room in Germany rather than uh, sitting in in Canada and, and actually doing work. What was the point at which you? Because there must have been a point where you had too many staff to manage personally, and 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 you realised you needed to put in place a management structure. Did did you hit that point of pain, or because there were so many of you leading that business, did you did you did you sort of manage to transition into that quite easily? So what happened is, and and we realised that I think because we were three, that point was much higher because the three of us controlled absolutely everything in the business, and I don't think we we realised the wall we were hitting, and once we hit that wall, I think we had maybe fifty five staff. Or sixty staff, wow. something managed like we by were, three of you. Yeah, yeah, like wow. yeah, by three. Wow, we had some. No, we had some managers, but I mean, okay. when we really hit the wall of of not having a good management structure, um, was around that time. So it was much farther. Like you know, if we would have been either alone, like if I had been alone, or if we were two, I think we would have hit it much earlier, and it would have been not as hard to get out of. Um, so what we did is we implemented EOS. This is a long time ago as well. Uh, and that was obviously a game changer for us. I, I would say any business of any size, once you've got staff, that's a that's a must read book. Um, um, traction. 
Um, so, so, so you talk about the management principles. Ex- explain what those management principles are. I think S3, we really have a big culture at S3. And uh, it's really a culture of like work hard, play hard. We also celebrate. We've got a culture of um, like if you come to an, our office, it's open space, ping pong tables. Uh, we have a bar, beer on tap. We actually make our own beer. So we have all these things that are like, like externally you would think, oh, that's the culture, but it's not. That's like secondary. Really the basics are managing people properly. So to us, that's having managers that are trained but, and also that don't have too much staff. So we have like, yeah, maybe nine, eight, nine maximum per manager. We make sure all the staff is met at least on a monthly basis. We do quarterly evaluations. We have career pl- paths for all of our staff. Um, and I think... I think you can have all the rest of the things like we do all those, those other culture things, but without doing the basics. And what I mean by the basics is managing people properly. That's, it's just, it's fluff. Like it doesn't, I don't think it'll make a difference, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I get that. So, so you, you, you're saying gimmicks don't, gimmicks are nice to, nice to have, but they don't, they don't make a core difference to the, to the business. If, if, if your people aren't led well, um, it's not going to make a difference. Yes. I, I mean, I think there, Gimmick. I mean, they're not gimmicks. They're real in a sense. They're really cool things. But I think you need to do the basics before you add on to it. You know, and I think the basics is just good management of your staff. It's so important. Yeah. I mean, they say that yeah, when that makes- pe- people leave, they always leave a manager, right? I think it's like, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's it's by far the biggest reason why people leave. So. Oh, completely. And I think we, you know, I don't think you've ever properly had a job have you i think i think helping out in a computer <laughs> hardware store doesn't really count but for those of us that had proper jobs which was me up till 30 you you absolutely try your hardest to escape uh, a bad manager you'll, you'll do anything um, to escape a bad manager let's talk about your partnership so you you guys have been together for a very long time and i started to ask the, the question as i was forming it in my mind at the end of the mm-hmm. podcast interview which is you know i we, we've all seen tons of partnerships that have fallen apart people get greedy people get lazy people argue uh, you know they, they start out as friends or, or, you know, often failure splits them up or, or also great success splits them up because of because of greed or you know whatsoever so how how have you guys are you are you all partners in propel your msp as well we are how have you guys done this because you you've i'm sure you're aware that you've achieved something that that very very small numbers of people managed to achieve? Yeah, it's not by accident. We work really hard at it. So we have, um, first of all, we meet, uh, we have an hour and a half meeting every week, like every week. Um, So we spend a lot of time together. In the meeting, we go over what's going on in our personal lives, what our plans are. We have different, obviously we have Propel, we have some real estate as well. Um, and, um, And yeah, just, I mean, it's like any relationship, communicating. So we do that once a week. We also, well, now with COVID, it's been difficult, but we usually do an annual retreat, just the three of us. We go off for yeah. a couple of days uh, and we usually just do annual planning. But a big part of that is around our personal lives, where we're heading, uh, what our objectives are. Yeah. You know what your business partners need from the business as much as they know what you need from the business. Yeah, yeah, and we're communicating. Got it. So there's no, there's no surprises for anyone then. No, exactly. And then the other thing too that I, I'm very strong on is like, We try to, well, we do actually, like everything we do, we do it together. That way there's no, I mean, there's no, I'm trying to minimize conflict, you know, or minimize um, situations that could lead to to conflict. Of course, if I went and invested in a side project that my two partners haven't invested in, I'm like, oh no, I'm just going to be a silent partner. Don't worry about it. I'm putting a bit of money into this thing. But if, if it's a sizable amount of money and all of a sudden the project's not doing so well, then you start putting time into it. Then your partners could be like, well, wait, what's going on here? You're starting to put time. <laughs> yeah. So we do things together. So if somebody has to spend a bit more time on, on Propel or S3, I mean, it's, you know, it's all the same in the end for us. And that's, I think it's, it's super important. But again, it, yeah. to me, it comes down to communication. And then um, the other thing too, is I think also when we did EOS, just really having our roles clarified and really the roles and responsibility. I think it took us a while to get it right, but I think, um, I think it's really good now. I've got a couple of sort of quick fire questions to hit you with, and then a a final, uh, a a final big question. Um, So first of all, if you could, uh, if if, do you know what Dr. Who is? Have you ever heard of Dr. Who? Dr. Who? Uh, just I'm, I'm i'm covering my hands up here so doctor who is is you know you know star wars forget star wars you know the marvel cinematic universe forget all of that the most important sci-fi show ever it's called doctor who 
Uh, it's a little British TV show. It's been running for 60, it's coming up for 60 years, uh, like 60 years of single continuity back from when it was black and white TV. And these days it's, you know, 4K and all that stuff. And it's, it's a pretty good show. If, if you've ever got, they rebooted it in 2005. So if, if ever you, you want to waste, you know, 16 years of your life, you can go back and watch it all. Anyway, <laughs> cut to the story. You, you'd probably know that the, the, doc, the doctor is the main character who changes actor every couple of years. But you've probably heard of the TARDIS. It's, it's there. It's, it looks like a, nope, okay, complete like You know, it's, in, in the UK, Doctor Who is so baked into the British culture that even people who don't watch TV know what Doctor Who is. And, and you're looking at me with a lovely fixed smile on your face. <laughs> So the, the um, basically he he stroke she is an alien uh, with two hearts and they're a time lord and they have a the thing called the TARDIS which is a blue box. So if a TARDIS lands in your garden tomorrow and you can get in it and you can go back to a point in your uh, in your in your let's say when you were twenty three, uh, you can go back. Cut a long story short, a long question short. If you could go back and talk to your twenty three year old self, what would you say to yourself? Um, I mean, the biggest differences in our business is when we joined our peer group and EOS. I think were the two the two major changes we made. So I think, I think, um, yeah, I think to look look externally uh, for help, definitely a peer group a little earlier. Um, and yeah, and then of course getting a business like you know we were three we three of us did computer engineering. So we had no management experience, I think to get a management system earlier in place or to actually, you know what it really is, is just to think about scale earlier. I think when we started mm-hmm. the business, we weren't like, we really wanted to grow the business. We were aggressive, but we weren't really thinking about scalability. Um, so I think that is the biggest thing. It's really like, it's so much easier to put a system in place, even if it's one person who's doing it. I mean, okay, I'm not just doing this to plug Propel, but like even for something like VCIO, no, but it's in my mind, it's, it's a good example. Like had I done that when I was the only VCIO and had the tool and, and you know, whatever the tool is. And then when I hired a, you know, my first VCIO under me, like right away, this is the process, this is the tool, this is how it works. Um, what a difference it makes for everything that is in the business. So I think, I yeah. think for us, that was probably the most difficult lesson for us to learn. Let's put it okay. Way. Okay. That's, that's good. Um, next, next quick fire question. And I'm not going to mention any sci-fi in this one um, <laughs> because of propel your MSP. And, and I'm sure just because you, you're, you're a target, a, a, a magnet for other MSPs, you know, it, people are naturally attracted to successful people who, who are in a position that they want to be from, from talking to other MSPs. What do you think holds back most MSP owners? Um, I think a lot of MSP owners are, I think they're really passionate about technology and they really care about their clients. Maybe it's the relationship um, skills or showing their value. Let's put it, put it that way. Like I think they're, they're working so hard for their clients, but they're not, they're not maybe showing their value properly to the clients. So it's almost communication, isn't it? It's, it's a, a communication skill. Yeah, I think so. I think for for the clients and then, yeah. It's interesting. You said you would tell your 23-year-old self to be prepared earlier for, for scale and, and to, to, you know, to, to get professional help, as it were, earlier on. Um, do, you, do you see that that is an issue for, for you know, the, the vast majority of MSP owners that you speak to? I think today is a little different with things with EOS and that out. I think people are starting to think uh, ahead a little more, but I still think that, I mean, but I get, I, you know, it's the same, like a... You're in a rush. There's a million things going on. Sometimes, oh yeah, I'll deal with the scale after. I'll do this thing quickly because it doesn't really need to scale right now. I'm, you know, there's only two people that are doing this thing. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely think it still applies, and it still applies to us. There's probably still a ton of things that we're doing that we should yeah. be thinking bigger, uh, bigger. And I bet you we could talk in five or ten years and probably tell you the same thing. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Well, a business is never finished, though, is it? Ever, ever, ever. Um, and you know, just at the yeah. point you, you've achieved huge success, that's that's when actually I think it's it's that's when you had well, you, you're well past the point that you need to have almost thought of the next thing from there. Um, Simon, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Um, thank you for that. Um, the, the final question I want to ask you is kind of what's next, and I'm going to leave that deliberately open. So I joked earlier about you um, you being a 
visionary and and you know if if you genuinely have it we, we could all say cyber security is 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 not just next but it's now and, and being an mssp you know it'd be very easy to say well that's that's the next big thing but w- when i say what's next i mean what's next for you what's next for propel your msp what's next for your msp what's next for for the world that we're in as in our, our msp world I would say, I think there's going to be a lot of vertical um, specialized MSPs. And um, so I think that's something that's very important to think about um, because at some point it might not make sense to make, to, to basically deal with an MSP that's not specialized in your vertical. If I was starting an MSP today, I would start a vertical MSP for sure. Yes, and, for sure, for and sure, you know what? So so would I, and I, I wouldn't start an MSP because it would clash with the work I'm doing with MSPs. But um, oh my goodness, I, I have um, three or four um, clients, members of my MSP Marketing Edge service, who who have a vertical. They haven't just picked a vertical; they've married the market. Um, there's there's two in particular I can think of. So one, it is their entire business, and um, they've been doing that for ten. 15 years or so and it's it's incredible you know they they utterly dominate their vertical in their country and another one has only been in that vertical for 18 months maybe two years but their their future is in that vertical and again they have achieved utter dominance and it was you know it's it, and we're talking a vertical that, that is it's, it's an arms folded vertical that doesn't like outsiders and you know in in, in a matter of 18 to 24 months or around about that they've, they've achieved literal market dominance so you could launch direct, you know with all your resources and your 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 cash and your time and your energy you could launch directly against them and you couldn't beat them in that vertical because they've, they've got the first mover advantage so i think you're you're absolutely right um, i think the trick is picking the right vertical or at least two that hedge each other in the market so that you're not you know if one vertical is not doing so well yes yes exactly that in fact the i had a marketing agency i sold uh, in 2016 so my very first business evolved into this as we were we were trying to find our place and we became a a, a niche healthcare marketing agency just for uh, opticians so optometrists uh, veterinarians and dentists and we started off with optometrists and in the UK there's not a lot of money in optometry so we, we moved into veterinary and then we moved into dentists because those three things were integrated and we actually did the same thing for each vertical but they had separate websites separate branding you know separate phone numbers even so we, we could tell who was calling whether it was a veterinarian or a dentist and that approach worked incredibly well and when we when we sold the business the the guy that bought it or it was, a, it was a, a marketing agency that bought it he was as, as interested in instantly having three very solid feet in three very solid verticals as much as he was acquiring the you know the, the business as it was so i think you're right you you've got to you've got to pick the vertical right simon thank you let's let's pause there as i say we could keep going for hours but give us again that 10 second plug for propel your msp yeah, propel, propel your MSP. Um, basically, a tool for roadmapping all your clients, really getting in front of your clients with a, a, a very detailed budget. Our tool is so customizable that the idea is two different MSPs could deliver out of the tool, and the client wouldn't be able to tell that it comes from the same tool. And we're not trying to tell you what to do. So, we've built it so that, I mean, we will gladly tell you what we think is the right approach, but it's so customizable that we've made it so that you can usually take your process and build it into our tool as well. And just remind us what your website address is finally. Pro- PropelYourMSP.com Paul Green's MSP Marketing Podcast. Extended Interview.